I'm Dr. Aga Piki. I'm co-manager of the Next UK project with Dr. Uh, Sarah Wolf. And we're very pleased to welcome now Ola Rice from University College of Dublin and Deborah Dean from Victoria University of Wellington. So Ola and uh, Deborah were part of the first Next UK summer school that took place in July 2021 with the help of Dennis DeBay from the University of Colorado, Denver, and in partnership with the Jean Monnet Center of Montreal. During four days, uh, young scholars from around the world and also from around the disciplines have had the opportunity to acquire new skills and uh, knowledge from academics and decision makers. They also had the chance to present the individual research and to discuss the impact of Brexit and COVID-19 on policies, methods and theories to study EU-UK relations. Brian's ideas came out from this event and will be very soon accessible to everyone in the collective report that all of the students have written together. Although each contribution is individual and based on personal expertise, together this paper serves a common purpose and helps to think about the future of EU-UK relations in 10 years, so in 2031, in a multiple and complementary areas. And uh, we believe and we strongly believe uh, that this report could be useful to scholars interested in this topic, but also to decision makers or to anyone. I will now leave the floor to Ola and then to Deborah to present the main results of their paper. Thanks, I got. Um... Yeah, so uh, my name is Orla Rice. I'm a PhD student um, at University College Dublin, Ireland, and myself and Deborah are just going to talk to you a little bit about um, our experience at the summer school and the collective report that was kind of the our output from that summer school. So in July 2021, a group of early career researchers gathered online for the first Next UK PhD summer school, and the theme was researching post Brexit and post COVID. EU-UK relations, what impact on policies, methods and theories. And the output, uh, as I said, was a working paper with 10 contributions and uh, the theme was kind of looking forward to where we might be in 2031. So uh, with the support of uh, the EU's Erasmus Plus programme and Queen Mary University of London, um, this course was developed to bring together a group of early career academics uh, with special interest in public policy, politics, and the legal and regulatory implications of what happens next for the EU-UK relationship um, post-Brexit. So we were uh, a, di a diverse group, um, and we were from and representing universities in France, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, Ireland, South Korea, India, Brazil, the US, Serbia, and New Zealand. So um, getting a time for the summer school every day was quite the challenge to suit everyone in different time zones. So I'll just uh, hand you over to Deborah now. Everyone in different time zones. Okay. So I'll just uh, hand you over to Deborah now. So I'll um, just as I'll start from Christopher Ede's piece on enlargement. Uh, so his contribution looks at whether the enlargement to the EU might be holding certain negative outcomes for both the enlargement actor and the and the EU state. Christopher argues that the difficulties which the EU, that the UK experienced in reconciling its national interest to the EU, EU monetary policy during its 43-year membership of the EU were fundamental to its decision to leave. Jeremy Walonski's contribution looks at Poland and one of the member states' experience in relation to the critical migration issues. Freedom of movement is one of the key pillars of EU membership and the evolution of British political opinion and migration policy and the question of what would happen to the migrant populations already settled in the UK have become acute, inviting the renewal of dual analysis of citizenship and post-migrant populations. Jeremy's view is that in time, uh, time will have to tell us what impact Brexit will have on the, the, these diaspora communities, which make up the UK and the Polish community, uh, which will certainly remain important in the UK. It will see, we sh are expecting to see, however, he is expecting to see, however, a slowdown and in European migration as a whole. He says that this will probably balance itself out in a few years to equalize countries historically tied to the UK, but that the communities will remain politically important and economically important. And the weight of this diaspora could then play an important role in the development of both the UK and the EU by 2031. 
UK-EU relations have much wider implications in the global marketplace, however, and Angelica Suko has commented on the impact that Brexit will have on the Southern Common Market, Mercosur, and the South American markets and economies generally. Angela states that Brexit clearly opens up new economic opportunities for both for Mercosur and for Brazil in particular. The UK tr traditionally tends to adopt a more liberalizing approach in trade terms, being less protectionist than some EU member states, which may be in line with the demands from the, ag the agricultural sector in Mercosur. She expects, however, that by 2031, the UK-Mercosur relations will have been proved to the point of a potential trade agreement, similar to the one negotiated with the EU, which will also be ratified by that time. Trade has been at the heart of Brexit, and Hu Pang Long Hong considers the implications for and the future direction of the UK's trade policy. The limited coverage on services in the political negotiations, which led up to the withdrawal agreement, is a particularly vulnerable point for current UK-EU post-Brexit deal and is likely to impact its future as well. Hyungpo says that we should keep looking at the future trends in the UK's services trade and changes at the related policy settings because of the considerable contribution services makes to the UK, UK output and its competitive strategy. The UK should, Hupong says, diversify its trading partners with large and growing fast service areas such as Asia, including China and India, beyond Europe, while maintaining close and mature economic ties with the traditional counterparts in the region, such as Japan, Singapore and South Korea. My co-presenter, Orlath Rice, looks at the question of beyond economics, how the Northern Ireland Protocol affects the, quote, Irish question and how the UK's decision to leave the EU has inadvertently put the question of Irish reunification back on the table 100 years after the island was partitioned. The protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland de facto keeps Northern Ireland in the EU, but the future of those arrangements has already come under strain. Efforts to avoid a, quote, hard border, either between Ireland and Northern Ireland or between Northern Ireland and the UK, has proven fractious and even threatened the political agreements of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. As the EU member state most directly affected by Brexit, Ireland's relationship with the EU, Northern Ireland and the UK has generally changed more dramatically since 2016. However, a united Ireland could open up a Pandora's box of constitutional, political and economic questions for Ireland as well as posing a significant challenge to the constitutional integrity of the UK. Similarly, Robert Pope's contribution looks at the aftermath of the Brexit for, the Irish, for Irish reunification. Tied to matters of immigration and migration, the UK Leave campaign focused on the lack of control over the UK's borders because of the quotas that saw many refugees being brought into the UK through the European Union and other EU member states. Robert points out that the concerns that plagued the UK, such as in the past, uh, pertaining to human rights, prior to the signature, the signature of the Belfast Agreement, the European Court of Human Rights, as well as scholars and advocates have associated the ECHR view that the UK is a major violator of human rights. Robert believes that over time, Northern Ireland will more likely move towards the Republic of Ireland for obviously economic economic incentives and that Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will become reunited and populations on both sides of the border uh, who, who even though they may not exactly they may not favor that that approach are trending towards unification and could see Northern Ireland rejoining the European Union sooner rather than later. Another area which demonstrates the far-reaching impact of the EU the UK's withdrawal from the EU is Debenjali Ghosh's contribution on Brexit and higher education. India and the UK have had a long and robust relationship in the field of higher education. However, in the post-Brexit period, the UK has experienced changes to its visa regime, which along with its new educational policies has, had, has the potential for completely overhauling its relationship with India and non-EU countries in the higher education sector. Devin Jolly feels that there is great potential for both India and the UK to collaborate further, but at the same time, the UK is likely to face certain challenges in attracting Indian students. 
cooperation in higher education is an important component of the EU-India relationship, and other EU countries like Germany have increased their attractiveness through easy visas paired with English-based programs, low tuition, ample scholarships, and post-study employment opportunities. In the long term, Brexit has the potential to further increase the UK's attractiveness as a study abroad destination for Indians, but easy visas without matching financial aid and the potential to endanger have, have the potential to endanger the UK's predominant position in UK's in India's uh, education market over the next decade. Finally, my contribution on the brave new world of financial services looks at the impact which Brexit has had and is likely to have on this critical economic sector. During the withdrawal negotiations, financial services law and regulation were notably absent from the UK and EU's Brexit agenda. Goods, fisheries, and the Irish border became the hot topics, and the vital role of the financial markets post-Brexit were largely ignored. The idea of equivalence as being the means of keeping UK and EU law and regulation in alignment and replicating the benefits of the single market were crucial at the beginning of the withdrawal negotiations. But as time has gone on, it has been shown to be unworkable, both politically and economically, and it is now possible to declare equivalence and its sister mutual recognition officially dead. Finally, one cannot discount the effects of COVID-19 or even the effects of a, a major catastrophic economic downturn, along with the global drive towards increased uh, sustainability and net zero and how that will impact not only financial services, the financial services sector, but the development of the EU and the UK in the next decade. It is likely, however, that somehow the EU and the UK will still be here in 2031, perhaps not as we know them, but we hope that the powers that be will, will uh, develop, uh, the, in, develop the, and act as, to build a better future for the UK, the EU, and their respective citizens. Orla, could you scroll forward a cup? Yeah, then we'll go to themes. Okay, that one is very good. So um, the intention of the report, uh, as I say, was to bring together the comments, the observations from the participants in this boot camp program. Uh, most of the participants are members of the next generation of academics and researchers. And it was a great week to uh, bring together ideas to allow us to explore a whole range of issues uh, to do uh, focused on the on the aspects of, of Brexit in the EU. Uh, and we hope that this this report uh, brings together some of those ideas and will um, show you how the the new generation is thinking as we move into this area of political and social change. Next one, please. So in terms of, uh, we, Orloff and I looked at the question of common themes and we sort of, um, these came out of both the, the, the collaborative paper that we've put together and also the discussion that we've enjoyed during the boot camp. So in the first instance, I think everyone agreed that the EU UK relationship got off to an in inauspicious start. And uh, as it has been described as uh, the two now sit as the best of enemies. Um, there is obviously a history of poor personal relationships and entrenched positions uh, on both sides um, of the, the, the English Channel. Um, the, also the EU as a consensual process um, and the need to keep all EU members on side uh, obviously had some con imposed some constraints in terms of the negotiations and the development of the relationship. Most recently, um, the resignation of Lord Frost and the appointment of Liz Truss as the chief UK negotiator does, however, present some opportunity to perhaps reset that relationship and see if it can take us into a, a, a better period and a, a more fruitful period of negotiation. So do we have detente or do we have stalemate? Well, again, I think it depends upon your point of view. What is clear is that there was a serious case of Brexit fatigue, both in the UK, where the motto was get Brexit done, but also in the EU, where the message was clearly we are moving on. 
the question I think that um, many of the participants in the, in the boot camp considered was, was there enough actually goodwill to get Brexit done at the end of the day as both parties moved in quite different directions? Another key theme was the future of the political declaration. This agreement uh, had been negotiated in rather hothouse conditions uh, within the time limited withdrawal period. Both of the parties are clearly wishing to undo parts of the agreement which had been um, have now been determined to be unworkable, particularly the Irish border situation. So what is the what is the future for the political declaration? Well, we still don't know. Um, the EU is maintaining its position that that was what was agreed, whereas the UK obviously wishes to resile from a number of, of the uh, concessions that they made in the original period. The other thing is clear that both the UK and the EU are wishing to, quote, take back control. We, I think most people recognize that there was a new and more muscular approach to negotiations uh, after the initial shock of Brexit. The UK government, um, as it stands at the moment, and I just checked the, um, to make sure that Boris had not actually resigned in the last 15 minutes, um, is moving in a new direction. And that, as I said before, mutuality and equivalence are effectively dead. The EU too is also moving in a new and different direction with increasing Europeanization and harmonization. So again, I think the thing is that uh, both parties will develop their own approaches. And as I say, they may move in very different directions over the, over the, next, um, over the next decade. The law of unintended consequences. Well, back in 2016, not long ago, uh, Lawrence Friedman of King's College London said that extracting the United Kingdom from the European Union is not going to make either body stronger or better able to cope with the current set of security challenges, whether from Russia or ISIS. It could leave both in a much weaker position, so there is little clarity on whether what Brexit is intended to achieve. It is hard to think of a greater test of the law of unintended consequences. I think we can all uh, understand how those comments have effectively worked their way through the, the political and economic process over the last uh, five years, uh, or yes, five years now since, since the, the referendum. I think that no one, least of all the United Kingdom government, um, understood the complexity of the separation process and there are plenty of unintended consequences. I have spoken to uh, colleagues and friends in the tre UK Treasury, and they have estimated it will take approximately 20 years to, un to separate effect the, uh, the legislative and, and um, uh, framework that had been set up when the UK was a member of the EU. Areas such as security, defense, data protection, financial services, health and education are all areas where he, we have already seen uh, the law of unintended consequences arising from the withdrawal. The recognition of judgments, uh, tax issues, um, procurement. So for example, the controversy over COVID vaccine provision. And of course that area which is most um, at the heart of British is their pet passports were all um, areas where, again, the unintended consequences of Brexit uh, finally came home to people. And then the other, as the final aspect is playing to the home team. Um, there is, and there still remains, uh, residual Euroscepticism here in the UK, and there are still internal, uh, internal politics within the EU which are at work. Uh, both the UK and the EU governments have to keep their domestic markets on side. And we are seeing that playing out uh, currently in the, uh, the French election coming up later this year. Immigration was, of course, a major issue. And now the cr uh, refugee crisis from the Middle East and Afghanistan are creating new tensions between the two, the two parties. And then finally, we, and we can't finish this without talking about COVID-19, that has clearly impeded the Brexit process and brought new economic and social stresses and strains. So I think the thing is that uh, there, there, there are plenty to talk about and to consider what the EU and UK relations will be like in 2030.
31. So I'll hand over to Olaf, Olaf to finish the next section. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm not going to take too long wrapping up. So just in terms of looking forward to 2031, so 10 years from now, some of the questions um, and predictions raised in the paper include the following on the screen. So the question of will there be increased withdrawal from the EU now that a member state has left? Um, questions and predictions about how to maintain a positive EU UK, EU UK relationship. Um, questions about the constitutional status of the UK, um, especially considering uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland maybe moves for independence. Uh, the UK's relationship with Ireland, its closest neighbour, uh, its status in the education market, of course, questions about trade and supply chains, and maybe where both the UK and EU will go to find new partners and new opportunities. Um, uh, questions about the single market and migration, um, now that EU migrants and non-EU migrants um, are no longer kind of classified in the same way in the UK after Brexit. Um, and the kind of the further expansion and, and consolidation of the EU, where, where do they go from here? So yeah, just to say that it, it's a really interesting time for uh, to be researching EU-UK EU, relations as we are all sort of living through uncharted uh, political territory. And then, so this was just a list of the, the students and researchers who have contributed to the uh, collective report. Um, and I think I think I will uh, leave it there. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, um, we we're happy to answer them. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. Thank you very much, Deborah, for for this uh, presentation. Um, so now uh, you can ask. I'm talking to the audience. You can uh, ask your questions in the chat, and I will then uh, forward them to to Ola and Deborah. But maybe I will ask uh, with the. I will start with mine. So. Um, the first question to, to Deborah. Um, I think it, it was really interesting to have you uh, participating in the summer school as you have uh, maybe specific personal trajectory, having been a practitioner for many years and then getting back to, to academia. And so based on this experience, uh, maybe if you could say uh, some words about how to further connect academia to decision makers and to to practitioners if you have some ideas about that i would be very interested in uh, hearing them and then a, a question to um ola um so it was really interesting to have this collective uh, discussion but maybe can you say a bit more about what's so specific about the new generation what what's so different um between your generation the new generation of scholars and maybe um, the the old ones in uh, uh, explaining and studying EU UK relations. So I will start with you, Deborah, and then Ola, if you if you want to take some time to answer my question. Thank you, Agatha. That's a very um, interesting and a very appropriate question. Um, yeah. So I've spent thirty five years as a practicing lawyer here in London in the banking and financial sector, both in large financial institutions and in magic circle firms and in the big four accountancy practices. And one thing that the my returning to or going back to academia at this stage has proved has shown me is that there should be much more synergy and there's much to learn, uh, both from the practitioner's point of view and from the academic's point of view. Um, on the one hand, the practitioners basically don't have the time and as I say, they don't get paid to um, consider the bigger picture, to consider the big issues, to look at policy. They're there to answer, in most cases, to answer a specific question or to deal with a particular transaction for a, a particular client. Academia, on the other hand, have more time to be able to consider the big picture. But that how that is then communicated to the practitioner, I think there's a significant gap there, which organizations like Queen Mary uh, University could uh, help to bridge that gap. So for example, I was reading an article today saying that uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, my old firm, um, is quote, doubling the size of its legal practice or its legal services practice. Um, and that's the sort of organization, and again, EY has a similar legal um, uh, 
legal services business, as does KPMG and some of the other um, smaller uh, accountancy practices, um, that academics could work together to support those sort of, um, you know, those legal practices uh, in a way that um, benefits the clients in the in the larger term, and particularly in, in the in the area of uh, uh, policy development. I mean, all the big organizations and their clients are very keen to understand and in many cases to actually influence uh, the development of policy. And that's where academics, I think, can do a lot more than they're doing at the moment to contribute to that debate and, and uh, make a positive contribution to uh, the practical side, if you will, of the law. Thank, thank you very much, Deborah. Ola, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. So um, what's different between maybe my generation and the generations before me? That's that's a big question. Um, and I can only kind of speak from my own experience. I guess that um, I've always taken kind of globalization and this really interconnected world um, for granted. So that's why I think it's really interesting now to be studying um, and Brexit and kind of what it means that's that a, that a member state might want to withdraw from that sort of interconnectedness. Um, and also I think maybe the the kind of mainstreaming of Euroscepticism is maybe uh, not completely new, but this wave of it is kind of a new phenomenon. And so this kind of maybe the last 10, 20 years is when people have really been studying this new wave of kind of right-wing Euroscepticism. So maybe Maybe that's the difference, but I, I, yeah, I can't really speak for for anyone else. Can I just step in here? Because I think one of the things is that the current um, generation is so lucky because of the improved communications and the ability, again, to work collaboratively with others. Um, again, you know, as I say, what would we have done without Zoom and StreamYard and Hopin and and all of the other um, uh, you know technologies which are now available to you? As I say, in the good old days when you used to have to go to the library to get a book out, um, it is fortunately now gone because we now have digital library or access to articles, access to a much wider uh, range of material. So I think that. Um, uh, it's a very lucky young generation that and, and that can, um, you know, ha has that ability to communicate in a way that was simply 20, 30 years ago, we simply did not. No, I, I fully agree with you and with this idea that we, we are able to, to connect to each other. And it was clear during the summer school, um, you, you, you made it very clear. We had people from um, South Korea, from the UK, from Ireland, from uh, the US, from very different parts of the world. And I think it was also part of uh, the success of this uh, summer school was to have so many people coming from different places where maybe EU UK relations were not seen from the same perspective, were not studied with the with the same tool. I think it was also uh, very interesting for, for everyone and including for for Sarah uh, and I. Um, we've got another question um, from uh, Paul uh, Tello, who say that um, you've raised a great set of question rather than offering many answers, but maybe because <laughs> it's still quite difficult to, to bring uh, full answers to, to the whole set of questions that you ask. Um, were there any sense of when there might be a turning point from mutual estrangement between EU and UK and what we would take to start rebuilding cooperative relations? So if you could say a few words, I don't know who wants to start. Well, if you want to go first. Um, sorry, so was the question when they, want, a we, they we, want to know what the solution is? <laughs> yeah, no, I know definitely for, for my own contribution, I was very wary of um, making sort of concrete predictions because um, I guess we really don't know. And I will say, I think we picked 2031 because we thought that by then we could maybe reflect a little bit and uh, be able to come up with some sort of um some kind of theories to understand how we got to where we were but i would say yeah gosh i wouldn't be 
I wouldn't be predicting anything until at least we get to 2030 and we can look back and see the route that we took. Um, but yeah, Deborah, I don't know if you want to come in on that. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is that, yes, I mean, I think there were plenty of different views as to what 2031 will look like. I think the one thing to remember is that the pace of change um, has accelerated, I think, over the last third, well, certainly since the Second World War. And I think we're, we're still experiencing it now. Um, I think that my personal view is that the UK and the EU will continue to move in their own directions and they will move, they will diverge uh, rather than move together. Um, again, I, you know, political issues such as the Northern Ireland situation and the Irish border is obviously a very difficult one uh, and it's a key one for uh, you know, for, for both parties. But I think the UK, certainly under the current government, uh, again, I think one of the speakers earlier today suggested that, well, things might change if we get a, if we get a change of government, and that may or very well may be, or if indeed uh, at the next general election, the UK moves, say, for example, back to another coalition government. Um, you know, a week is a long time in politics, and uh, as I say, trying to predict what things will happen in, in 10 years is, is a quite difficult situation. And during the presentation, there was, there was this idea that I really um, appreciated, and I think it, it offers a lot of food for thought. It's that it's not only the UK uh, taking back control, but it's also the EU. Um, and I think it, it, it raises a lot of questions also about uh, What's up for what's next for for the EU now that the UK has left? And it was quite clear uh, during the negotiation that the EU was really trying to act as one and to face the UK as one. So um, maybe yeah. you can say a few words about this idea of the EU taking back control. I don't know, Ola or Deborah, if you. Yeah, I think I think again, you know, the EU. I think, as I said in, in the presentation, you know, after the shock of 2016, because again, I think to a certain extent the EU still, you know, simply didn't believe that they would do it. Um, you know, it became very difficult. It became more difficult for that, for um, the the UK to determine what is the, the, the future of the EU. Um, there have been stresses and strain, strains in terms of Austria, in terms of the um, you know, Lithuania, Estonia, some of the other countries, you know, but even say, for example, Denmark, you know, some, there are not, there are different voices. Okay. And I think the thing is that the European Union wanted certainly in the, in the EU withdrawal or the UK withdrawal to speak with one voice. And that's a very difficult um, position to come to, which is why, as I say, Barnier had to stick to his negotiating position, no matter what happened, because he was, working within a fairly narrow remit. Um, here, as I say, the, the UK generally, you know, they'll agree something and then they'll just rip it up later and then decide, you know, to shout on loudly enough in English and hope that somebody takes notice. Thank you. And there's, there's, there's uh, also a suggestion from Sandra in the chat um, saying that it's uh, maybe another crisis that will bring everyone uh, together again and that We've got uh, plenty of different crises uh, going on those days. So uh, well, let, be... let's let Russia invade Ukraine and see what happens. <laughs> with NATO. Yeah, for sure. It could be Russia. It could be China too. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, another. I see that the, the UK country. has um, uh, deported someone as being a an agent of China today. So there's plenty of uh, touch points where we could have a. a a crisis and and remember we're still not out of covid yet yes for sure um and maybe a last um question so in the collective report there was so many different policy areas that were that were um discussed but what are the policies that you feel have not uh, attracted enough attention from policymakers i know deborah you, you mentioned financial services uh, during your presentation but maybe ola do you want to say a few words about that because we've been talking so much about fisheries, um, about economic, uh, 
maybe you also have a view on that. Uh, yeah, well, really, I only know my own kind of area, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I just I find it um, striking that it's kind of opinion polls and, and surveys run in the UK don't really flag the Northern Ireland Protocol as a, as a major issue. But it, it is a huge issue for, for people in Northern Ireland and the Republic. So um, I, I think it's hugely important and, and for not for economic reasons, for kind of ideological um, reasons and constitutional reasons and political reasons that I think weren't fully considered um, in the run up to Brexit. Um, and yeah, I just think it's interesting that, you know, the centenary of Northern Ireland has just been commemorated. The foundation of the Irish Free State has just been commemorated um, 100 years. So uh, I think it's a it's a an interesting coincidence. And I do think it's not always on the UK's radar. So I guess that's all I would say. You're on mute, Agatha. Sorry, I was I was uh, saying, Devraj, do you want to say something more? Yeah, I mean, again, I think the whole question in, in, of services is um, a big one, which again, because of the, the policymakers got largely distracted, as I say, by things like fisheries and and as I say, I and again, I I would certainly second Orla's uh, uh, comments about the Northern Ireland situation that has. Um, you know, real potential. But again, you know, when you look at the the, the Scotland situation, I mean, again, uh, the UK government has its face completely set against another referendum. But again, we could have a change of political party that, you know, again, we may see the breakup of the UK as, you know, in its current form. Um, again, Brits don't change easily, but uh, you never know. So again, the as I say, my view was that, you know, the unintended consequences of Brexit um, will take decades, generations to work through the process. So, um, and, and we can't fix all of them. So, as I say, it, um, it's a question of fighting the fires that we can fight. For sure. I think we will. Uh, and now um, I see in the chat that some people are asking where uh, the reports will be available. So um, the report is getting finalized now. So uh, each contribution will be published as a blog on our website. Um, so you just have to type um, Next UK on, on the internet and you will find our website and we'll publish all the individual contributions and then we will publish uh, the policy report but you can still uh, follow us also on uh, CER uh, and QMUL on uh, Twitter and we will advertise when each individual contribution is um, advertised and I also see in the chat that some people would like to have um, access also to the list of questions that will be asked in the working paper. So maybe um, we can send you the, the the PPT, just send us an email after the, the conference and we can send you uh, today's presentation. Thank you very can much. I, Agatha, Agatha, can I just say from all of us who participated in the, the first PhD boot camp, uh, how much we appreciate the work that you and Sarah put together. Uh, I mean, it was a it was a fantastic week with um, a lot of information, a lot of uh, opportunity for us as quote budding academics to um, uh, to develop our skills. So again, thank you to Queen Mary University London, and thank you to uh, to the you know to the two of you particularly uh, for putting the the program together for us. It was it was a pleasure, a real pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Ola. Thank you very much, Deborah, for, for being here today, for taking the time. And I'm sure all the participants of the of the summer school have also appreciated your your presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, so we will join again tomorrow at uh, 10 CT 9 UK time for, for day two. And all the program is available on our website or on Hopping. You just have to go um, to the reception page and you will see the, the world timetable. Thank you, everyone. Thank you once again to, to the both of you. And uh, we hope we'll see you soon, uh, maybe in person this time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.